Hi fellas, Leos here. For centuries, mankind was dreaming of the idea of reaching the skies, and just decades after accomplishing the goal, humanity managed to land on the moon and fly through space. Only to die from a small ass pellet, damn it, it came like a bat out of hell! So 2D shooters, huh? My controller doesn't work anymore. Remember how every console had like a third of the library being space shooters? Just take one out. Going back to the beginning of the universe in 1971, when the creators of Atari also created what we know as the first arcade game, Computer Space. It was a sign. The design of the machine was... Uh, sure was the first one. The game itself was basically competing against the machine to see who could kill more aliens. So, multiplayer asteroids. It took them 8 years for that. But anyway, the game was such a big success that they moved on to create other classics like Pong, Tato released Space Invaders, and Nanko created Pac-Man. Guess which one doesn't fit? Yeah, Computer Space isn't fun to remember like the others. Hell, I only learned of its existence like 5 minutes ago and it was the one that brought life to the others like grandpa. But other than that, man, the arcade was the place to go. It was like a pandemic. All the arcades were mostly dark backgrounds, bleeps and bloops all over, and kids just having the PG-13 version of size comparison by, ooh, I have a score bigger than your dad. Finally accurate. The arcade was truly a magical place. Leftover pizza, bombing on the ground, kids screaming all over. It was heaven on earth. There was no feeling like grabbing your extra cash from school and going to play some games with your friends. Or at least watching others play. You have to bring a whole bunch of coins if you wanted some resemblance of fun for over 5 minutes. These games were brutal. After all, they weren't gonna make any money if a kid could play for like 30 minutes with one coin. Hell, some requested 2 or more and they were the hardest ones. The idea was to let the kid have some fun for a bit and then reality sets in. The AI in these games was, I mean, Skynet was based on arcade games. It wanted everyone dead on the floor before you could even reach the second stage, let alone the final battle. There's still a common belief that Space Invaders brought so much money that it actually affected the economy for a second there, causing a shortage of coins. I mean, it was all bullshit, but the game was so huge that people actually believed that for decades. That's mind-boggling. And sure, fighting games were one of the biggest sinners when it comes to cheap AI like Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, and that's fair, but at least they don't throw a bunch of shit at you from all directions. Ah, oh, Leo, what are you gonna talk about shooters? What the hell is this? I know guys, but before moving on, I wanted to show how all this came to be. During the heyday of Atari with the release of the Atari 2600, we got over 500 games where almost all of them had you shooting something. Not every game was like this, but it's a common fact that back then making shooters was easier with just one black screen with stuff coming at you constantly. Oh, I'm sorry class, from website. But after all that, there's a reason why space games were some of the biggest draws into the Atari 2600. Sure, there were classics like Adventure and Pitfall, but when people look back on the console, it's mostly this. Moving on, due to the oversaturation and low quality within the video game industry, the crash of 83 and 84 took place and most people didn't care about video games that much anymore, let alone arcades. That's when Nintendo came to save the day, with the first line of games masquerading as a toy with their little helper, Rob the Robot. There was variety with all the games, with fighters, platformers, and I um, guess you can call this a shooter. Yeah, they had to sneak around the first few years to avoid calling the NES a video game console. That's why the title of Entertainment System and not Video Game System. Imagine that timeline. Hey guys, wanna play Sonic? F no. Not that different. With time, Nintendo earned the love and respect from gamers for focusing on quality rather than quantity. Mostly. But remember, just because you run and shoot, that doesn't mean you qualify. Mario isn't a shooter. Nintendo started porting arcade games to the console like 1942 and 43, Galaga, and Gradius, but also created their own franchises like Light Force and Gun Neck. Okay, now this is what I thought about, right? Let's talk some games. The first Gradius came out in America in 86 by Konami, and this is old school Konami, so you know it's good. It introduced new mechanics like earning power-ups by shooting multiple enemies, but you didn't get the actual power-up, but instead a sort of level up that you had to pile up in order to get the power-up that you wish. That was a sentence. But of course, it was tough. The sequel, Gradius 2, introduced the option to select which set of power-ups you better suit you. And of course, again, these are very much made with arcades in mind. And yes, that is an insult. Back during the arcade games, when you get a game over, you had 10 seconds to continue. And that isn't to give you time to think whether you'll continue playing or not. You can insert a coin in like, what, 1 or 2 seconds, tops? The other 8 seconds are to run to the cashier, get more coins, run back, in hoping that the time didn't run out. Or someone took over. Yes, I'm still salty. But these games, I mean, I already talked about it, but I still believe that shooters are some of the guiltiest when it comes to the dreaded NES difficulty. Just look at another example, Silver Surfer. Yep. When you die in most of these games, you had to go all the way back, sometimes to the beginning of the stage, and with no power-ups whatsoever. And guess who had to file for taxes again? 
There's also Life Force, which in itself is a side game to Gradius with the same power-up mechanic, and most people see it as an improvement to the original games by including vertical shooting. And Hernia. They did not want you to have fun with these games, they wanted you to earn your way to victory, and yes, someone might die. On the other hand, there are some shooters that don't see you back immediately, but instead just render you weaker for a while. Like Twinbee and Gunnack, the latter of which is one of my favorite shooters in the system, not only because you can take more than one hit, but also because you can upgrade your weapons, bombs, and speed. And the variety of weapons, jeez, it's like an ice cream store here, and the machine actually works. But even though these games were more lenient with difficulty, they still sold way less than Life Force and Gradius. It's not just because of how tough they were, but again, the quality of their game was far above the competition. After all, it was Konami starting this golden age, which I believe only improved with the next generation. The Super Nintendo. My husband. Okay, I gotta prefix this by saying, yes, the Super Nintendo wasn't known for its 2D shooters. It was everything else. Boy, did that seal of quality really mean something in that console. Even though the Sega Genesis had a better processor that blasted it all the way to second place, there were still some bangers in the system, starting here with one in particular that is mostly known for its price rather than the game itself, Arrow Fighters. This is a reproduction card, and you know we ain't gonna live on the streets just for one game. Well, give me two and now we're talking. Aero Fighters came out in arcades in 92 and was ported to the SNES in 93. The original Japanese is Sonic Wings, which funnily enough is cheaper than buying the English version. It's got to do with the fact that the company that created it, Michael Ryber, closed down and also not that many cartridges were produced anyway. Great plan, guys. But anyway, moving on to the game, I find it just awesome, especially if you play with a friend. Sure, there's not many stages and only four pairs of playable characters, but the graphics, music and gameplay just make up for it. And yeah, there's some slowdown. Yeah. But it still has a charm to it, especially with explosions going on and also the variety of bonds for each character. And some are better than ours though. There are some that just cover a small portion of the screen with others just nuke the whole place and you got pretty much every ability you'll find in the world. And by the world, I mean... And every group- oh, oh wait wait, you're about to move? Well then to you bitch! And every group of characters has their own ending so it gives some good repeatability and you can increase the difficulty and try to make that investment worth it. That's the thing with these 2D shooters, they are short, and that's not really the worst thing in the world, otherwise it would drag out and the game would feel longer than necessary. As an example, here's Gradius 3, awesome game, improve on the others, steal on easy and kick your ass. The game actually gives you the option to select which power-ups to use during gameplay and that to me makes it my favorite, but the game's still bullshit though. It comes to the point where you have to fight like 5 bosses in a row and you think that would be the end of it. But no, it just keeps going for like 2 extra levels. Even the Mega Man series has the final boss after the boss rush. But Konami just went, <laughs> look at this bozo, and proceeded to make fun of us since. Oh, and don't forget, Axley, also from Konami, is just playing awesome. There's variety between vertical shooting, not 3D, so it still counts. Alright and horizontal levels that move you on the border of the screen. There's a story, who cares? You get multiple power-ups, and if you get hit, you only lose one of them, so you can keep playing until you lose all of them, and also you can improve them once you beat the level. Your ship moves at just the right speed so you can avoid enemies and attack properly. If you get shot, well, your fault, bitch. The bosses are, of course, incredible for the console. Those shooters really just flex when it comes to enemy design, and the music just slaps all the way through. What really sucks about the game is that no Axley 2 was ever produced, even though it was teased at the end if you beat it on the hardest difficulty. Surprisingly, with all these things going on, there's not that much slowdown. Oh, oh, oh never mind. This game's really managed to show from the beginning what they're all about, and that's important on how you demonstrate your game to your objective market, because you don't want to creep the shit out of them. Well, what do I know? I don't work in marketing. Phalanx, the perfect example of- Ah, oh, f***, our name is just fine, what do we do? I mean, the game is alright, but nothing to write home about. Especially Grandpa, don't let him know. When it comes to great arcade ports, one of the best is UN Squadron, made by... Huh. Capcom. Finally decided to show up. Street Fighter got you busy? I mean, this game is just fantastic. You got a map to decide where to go next. You can choose between three characters, each with their own benefits and drawbacks. You get multiple power-ups. You got a life bar that doesn't just take multiple hits, but it hits up. And if you get hit before it recovers, well, you're toast. So that gives you some balance of difficulty. The music, once again, fantastic. God, Leo, stop sucking the genre's dick! These companies really know that if you're gonna make us play the same stages over and over, at least I should enjoy getting ripped apart for one. Huh, anyone remember Iron? Yeah, they actually made a whole bunch of arcade games like, uh, Ninja Baseball Batman. I should just end it there, that's the best part. But I never came to the home console, but what did was the R-Type series, starting with Super R-Type, a port of R-Type 2. 
Uh, this game is funny. The stages are in different order from the arcade. You move slow as hell and it just looks beautiful. Wait, I like the game or not? It feels like the 2D shooter equivalent to Castlevania. You gotta think twice before you move and react accordingly. You have to play at its own pace, otherwise it's back to the beginning of the stage. Yeah, no checkpoints on this one, even if you reach the boss. The ship's uh, ball thing it serves as your power-up, and the idea is to learn how to use it to keep it close when you have enemies coming to you, and also launch it when you need to take around coming enemies, so there's a learning curve that, I mean, it doesn't matter. The game is brutal either way. And yes, thank you for reminding me, it has probably the worst slowdown of any game on the Super Nintendo. R Type 3 has no slowdown. The sequel exclusive to the Super Nintendo is just everything the previous game wishes it could do. It has a better ball. The operation was a success! It actually looks even better, includes checkpoints, and the music, I mean, they would play that at my funeral. And even though the game is still brutally difficult, I believe that improvement in speed and power has make it even more enjoyable than Super R Type. Remember how I said that the Super Nintendo was my childhood system? Well, I'm glad to say I'm still finding gems on the console, one of the best being Space Mega Force. Also known as Super Oleste, which was made by the same company that created Gunnack on the NES. And it's close to perfect when it comes to vertical shooters on the console. There's no slowdown whatsoever. Oh, thank god. There's multiple power-ups that you can choose and upgrade multiple times, and you have to be smart about it, because sure, you can go with the ones that just shoot at everything on the screen, but some parts of the stage explode when you attack them, and that makes the whole thing worse for you. But if instead you choose a power-up that shoots straight, then the stage becomes way easier. There's some great elements of smart design on these stages, and I gotta hand it to Toho. Because, I mean, sh man, you lost the bet. The one thing that keeps the game from being incredible is that they basically reused the first stage for stage 10. That's it. The speed and power-ups you make you feel you can break the game once you get in the groove. And what's funny is that the difficulties only go from hard to wild, so you get fucked either way. And there's also a short game mode where you can go for the highest score on shortest stages. Listen, I'm just saying, if Nintendo Power ever comes back, I know what photo I'm sending. But overall, this game is just unbelievable, and I would say it stands as one of my favorite shooters alongside Axelite, Gradius 3, R-Type 3, and Aero Fighters. 3. Oh yeah, the arcade was still making shooters. Okay, I'll go quickly through this one, because over half the games on arcade were shooters anyway. So yeah, Aero Fighters had two sequels and a special one which basically was a mixture of everything for the first three games. And I mean, they are incredible, they're just improvements on the original and they got parts on the Saturn, Playstation and the... Neo Geo. One day, my friend. Other fantastic ones were the Darius games, Pro Gear, I mean, just look at this. Dude and Patchy and Giga Wing. This, without a doubt, is my favorite shooter, bar none. From the graphics, the gameplay, the sound effects, the score, like holy shit, I can't even finish reading that before the next stage starts. Now that is how you hook up with your audience, with big explosions and big enemies to take down. Yeah, they threw just everything at you to force you to insert as many coins as possible, but if you were lucky... Yo boss, there's a ship on the front, it's blowing everything up! Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Why are you waiting for? Send their mini forces, blow that ship to bits! <sighs> Ooh. What? Holy shit. He's done on Slay on 20, man! What are we gonna do? Boss? Boss? Hey, boss? Boss? You said I'm working for you, sir! I can't even imagine how it felt as a kid if I saw that on the arcades, but we still have enough going on with the console, like the Genesis. Oh, sh**, Sega Genesis! Yeah, it sucks that I didn't get to experience the Sega Genesis growing up, but I do know that most of the best shooters of that age came from that system, like Soldi, Struxon, Musha Metallic Uniform, Super Hydra Armor, <gasps> and Thunder Force 4. The processor allowed for better movement and swifter gameplay, and some of the music is set on par with the Super Nintendo. I still wish to get the games a shot one day. One day. With the beginning of the new century, some amazing games came out like Ikaruga, where you can shift between two different types of bullets to absorb and shoot with the other color. And this game was made by Treasure, which wasn't like the rareware for the Sega Genesis. Every game they made just was, I mean, it was tits. And also the infamous Mushihimesama, a perfect example of the so-called bullet hell subgenre where you can unlock the ability of not moving. And there's plenty more, but sadly after the second generation of consoles, 2D shooters were relegated to indie companies, and barely included as minor additions to bigger games from time to time like Nier Automata. And I know, some amazing shooters are coming out every once in a while, but when was the last time we played a Gradius game, Space Megaphor, Giga Wayne, or Air Fighters? These franchises sadly remember it, and I know that they deserve a second chance outside of just remasters and compilations. 2D shooters in general deserve a resurgence, just like any other genre. 
If fighting games manage to come back with Street Fighter 4, then why not make one amazing vertical and horizontal shooter that can walk companies and players alike into making more space shooters? That one's taking so long! Ah, doesn't count.